So I would encourage you to be careful who you take advice from. That's the long and short story of that clip. I was trying to find a clip that felt like my life. Does that, does that feel pretty much like it? And there's people who give you bad advice. By the way, David shared something with me last night because he is a wise man of many, many talents. He watches too much TV. So, but he said there was three months between the beginning of that clip and the end of the clip because uh, the actor, I can't think, actually broke his ankle in the middle of that clip. And you can actually see him hobble for a minute. And there were three months of recovery that had cut to the end of the clip. So anyway, so here's my point of all that. If you haven't been to church here and you're thinking, do we just watch movies? And the answer is yes. Uh, oh, wait, I mean, No. Uh, so, so, and, but hopefully it's something you'll remember, but, um, here's the deal. The truth for all of us is God has given us his word as a guide to encourage us, to help us find direction. The Holy spirit is the one that speaks to us. We, we, uh, often deal with difficulty and clarity, not understanding what we're supposed to do next. And sometimes life, if I don't know about your life, but sometimes my life feels like I'm jumping out a window, right? There's a situation that happens that we didn't expect that unexpected, uh, uh, resistance we had to something, or like I was talking about the kids as simple as spilling milk on your shirt or, or something, you know, um, we've all had those moments in life. And God's word gives us a guide. And so I want to encourage you this year, if you don't do anything else, if you don't develop any other habits, begin spending some time every day in God's word. Get still for a few minutes. Even if you're ADD like me, get still for just a couple of minutes and allow God to begin to Speak to your heart as you read his word and spend time. And here's the thing. The Bible says that, and Jesus reminded us that the Holy Spirit would actually help us to recall what Jesus said. Which basically means that you spend time in God's word and then you're going through life and you're dealing with a situation. And if you take a moment to pause and say, God, speak to my heart. That says that the Holy Spirit will recall what Jesus said. Which means that some verses, some thoughts from scripture, some some principles of passages will, God will bring to your heart and to your mind. Why? To help to guide you. And so thankfully, God's not going, well, I didn't have that in 3D. Sorry about that. Um, God knows. And he knows the plans he has for you. And so the idea of walking through life and trusting him. And so today we're going to look at the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is so practical to me. And here's what's amazing. Totally different culture. Totally different circumstance. Totally different time of life. And yet, when you look at the book of Nehemiah, are you okay? Are you okay over there? Uh, when you look at the book of Nehemiah, there's some principles in there that are applicable today. And it's amazing to me what Nehemiah did in, in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So we're going to pick up there today. We're going to talk about this idea of evaluating the situation. And I want you to think about it Maybe something specific in your life that you're looking for the next step. Maybe for you, maybe at the beginning of the year, it was as simple as I need to lose a few pounds or I need to get in shape. Or maybe it's I need a new job. Or maybe it's I got to I got to deal with this relative of mine, you know, or deal with my spouse or improve my marriage or uh, uh, reach out to somebody at work or improve my work, whatever it may be that you're dealing with. Hey, maybe it's that the doctor said to you uh, uh, sometime this year, you got one of these. Well, I got some bad news for you. And maybe that's what you're trying to evaluate now and figure out. So today I'm going to give you three principles that will help you to evaluate. And I believe this works in almost any situation, these three principles, because um, God's word just has truths that that, um, that help us as we try to navigate uh, this life. So we're going to look at those today and we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about evaluating by giving a plan, expecting resistance, and then allowing others to help, which is difficult. That's for, the, for some of us, that third one's more difficult than any of them. So here's some keys to evaluating. And I want to tell you a story first about one of the smartest people I know that lives in Mims. It's my brother-in-law's brother. His name is Ed. And Ed used to work for my dad a long, when I was young, if that, when I was young, that was a long time. We didn't have phones 
when I was young. My, my friend had the first cell phone and you carried it in the car in a bag and it was this big. And that was a long time ago. So Ed worked with us and then he came and worked at the Space Center. He was an engineer and one of the smartest people I know. But even smart people have their moments. So Ed bought some property in Mims and... Um, they had a bonfire one night out on their property, and they had property in a house, and they had some kind of tall grass that they would cut once in a while, but a lot of times they just let it go, and they'd go out there with a bush hog and just cut it down. And Ed, uh, while he had the bonfire, and I don't know why he did this, he would tell you he doesn't know why he would do this. He had a very sick chicken. And so he said, you know what? I'm going to kill that chicken tonight. That chicken has had enough suffering. And so sure enough, he went and cut the head off of the chicken. And then he thought, you know what? Instead of burying the chicken, I'll just throw it in the fire and get rid of it. And sure enough, Ed took the chicken's body and threw it in the fire. And if you don't know much about chickens, you're going to learn something today that will help you in your life if, if you don't get any other help in this sermon, this is what you're going to learn. So he threw the chicken in the fire, and the chicken without a head, because chickens don't have much of a brain anyway, the chicken woke up and began running. And it ran into the grass and began to catch his giant five-acre yard on fire as it ran around. So their first step was try to catch the chicken, and then the second step was, and then put out the fire. So they caught the chicken, put the chicken out, and then began to put out the fire. The fire got so bad, they thought they were going to have to call 911. But they finally got it under control and were able to put the fire out. Long lesson short is this. I don't care how smart you are. You will do something dumb in your life. Which makes, let me just be honest, which makes somebody like me feel so much better. <laughs> now, now, you don't know this because you're not me, but this happens to me almost every week. Almost every week, somebody comes to me and says these words. Pastor, when you tell stories about yourself, you make me feel so much better about myself. Thank you. I guess it's good to have non-examples in life. So it's nice when somebody who's one of the smartest people I know does something dumber than I would do, be, do at that moment. I've done much dumber things than that, but that was at that moment. And so as we look at what Nehemiah does, and Nehemiah deals with the situation, he's got to be careful what he does. The steps that he's taking, these are life and death steps for him. These are choices that he's making. Are the walls of Jerusalem going to get rebuilt? By the way, not too many years before this, they started to rebuild the walls, had some resistance, and stopped. And now in chapter 1, which we talked about last week, you've got Nehemiah who is devastated. He's fasting, he's praying, he's weeping over the condition of the people that are in Jerusalem and realizing we've got to rebuild the walls. God has called us back. The prophecies from the past have, have said this is what's going to happen. And guess what? God has called me to do that. And so that's where we pick up in chapter 2 because Nehemiah has started to realize, oh, wait a second, this is me. So here's the first point today. Develop a plan and don't let emotion lead. We're picking up in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4 through 8, and here we go. The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Time out. Smartest thing he could do. If, you don't, if you're going to nap after this part of the sermon... If you're going to nap after this part of the... Somebody fell asleep in church last night. That's why I looked up. All right. If you're going to nap after this part of the sermon, here's all I want you to know. If you don't learn anything else from this sermon, the best thing you can do when you're 
confronted with a question or confronted with having to deal with something, or maybe you've got a difficulty at work or at home in a marriage with a, with a, a diagnosis from a doctor or a situation, first thing, what is, you want? what is it you want? What is it you need to do? And I prayed. And what prayer is, is not just you saying words to God. It's you turning your heart. It's you turning the situation. It's you taking whatever the situation, the person, the difficulty, the struggle, and saying, God, help. You ever deal with a difficult person? It's real easy to focus on that person. You ever deal with a difficult situation? It's easy to focus on that situation. Nehemiah could have just blurted out. He was upset. You look in chapter 1. He's upset. He's crying. He could have looked at the king and said, (laughs) But it says, what did he do first? He prayed. He said, God, this is yours. This is yours, so you help me know what to do. So then it continues, okay? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. And I love this. Best answer ever. I'm going to translate it into our language here in a second. But listen to what he says. He says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight. Basically, king, if what I'm about to say makes you happy, which by the way, kings tended to be a little self-centered, so that was a good start. And if you like me, which by the way, the dude was the king's tester to see if what he drank would kill him. So you become friends after a while. So he says, king, if you're happy about this or if this makes you happy and if you like me, okay, then he says this. Let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king, and I love this, with the queen sitting beside him. But that's not there. That's not a throwaway sentence. It's showing that he was getting some input from his wife. A wise man. A wise man. By the way, one of the things I love, all of our tech team this morning, three ladies up there, engineers, one runs a TV station, some genius women. Never downplay what women can do. And so, and so here we are, and, and they say, hey, hey, he's sitting here with his wife, which, by the way, didn't mean he was just sitting with his wife. He's like, what do you think? Right? By the way, some of the men who love to talk about how men are the head of the home, and men are the strongest, and men are the smartest, are, then look at their wife and go, was that okay? I've just learned that over the years. The ones who always came to me and were kind of in my face about that were always the ones that I'm like, well, your wife tells you what to do all the time. But I didn't, you know, anyway, okay. I meant to hold that in. Did I say all that out loud? Some of that was. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? Well, he's getting information. It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, May I also have letters to governors of trans-Euphrates so they'll provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asap, keeper of the royal park, so he'll, by the way, that's a forest. So he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for my house. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. This was an emotional time for Nehemiah. This was a time where Nehemiah could have blown it. If you look at chapter 1, Nehemiah was very emotional. He was dealing with what was going on, but but he was ready. You know how I know he was ready? Because the king said, what do you need? And Nehemiah goes, how about... A letter to this guy, a letter to this guy, safe passage here. What do you think, king? He was ready. He had prepared. He didn't just go in there and freak out. He said, I've already thought through what I need. And by the way, I love how he includes his house in there. You notice that? Like he knew. You know, one of the things they say on the plane when it comes to to living is what? When the mask drops down, you put the mask on you before you put your mask on your kid. Because if the kid passes out, you're not getting a mask. 
So sometimes we got to realize you got to take care of you. You got to take care of your needs so that you can take care of others. Nehemiah knew that. My dad, when we talked a lot of times about people working with him, my dad was a contractor, if you didn't know that. A general contractor in Miami built lots of high rises, built a lot of houses. And sometimes he had people working for him that he would tell you were better and smarter than he was. And he would say, you know why they are not the boss? Because they can't control their emotions. If, if they could control their emotions, they would be the boss. But they can't be the boss because they get too angry. They throw stuff. They walk off the job. They offend the customer. So I have to kind of keep them away from the customer and deal with them myself. But they actually can do that work better than I can. So why can't they be the boss? Because they don't have emotional intelligence. They can't control their emotions. They let their emotions run them. Listen, you will ruin your family. You will ruin your friendships. You will ruin your job if you allow your emotions to run the cart. If you allow your mind and you allow your will to overcome your emotions, you will live a much, much better life. I love this quote. To the person who does not know where he wants to go, there's no favorable wind. Basically, if you've never thought about what you want to see God do, if you've never thought about what you need to happen in your life, then you're never going to do anything. My grandmother told me, and my mom and I talked about this on the way home last night from church, my grandmother told me, gosh, 50 years ago, I was a little kid, and she said, sometimes I have to take a walk when your grandfather and I are talking. What does she mean? Because she'd get so mad that she'd have to take a walk. And so on the way home, my mom looks at me and goes, you know she threw a neighbor lady in the ditch one day. Oh, what? what? This neighbor lady was cussing at your grandfather, and your grandmother went out and grabbed her and dropped her in the ditch. So taking a walk was good for her, right? And what was she saying to me? Sometimes when you're too wound up and you're too emotional, one of the best things you can do is stop talking and take some time to back away. Nehemiah had already taken some time to back away. He had already evaluated what he was going to do. And we're going to look at more of this in a couple of weeks. But he understood that something had to be done. And he didn't just allow the emotion to take over. He began to say, here's what needs to be done. When's the last time you made a list? I, I, don't, I mean, a physical list is great. But even in your mind, begin to make a list of something you want to see happen. What you want to see God do. When's the last time you broke down a prayer request? Put a name in your car of somebody you're praying for. Somebody that you're saying, God, would you give me an opportunity to invite them to church? God, would you give me an opportunity just to encourage them to be a blessing to that person in the cubicle next to me that drives me crazy? Number two, expect resistance or the unexpected. And in life, there's expected and unexpected. And some people consider expected unexpected. Let me show you what I mean. How many of you have ever taken your car in to get the oil changed or changed it yourself, Dave? All right. Right? Everybody. If, if you're a car owner, I hope that you or somebody in your family takes the car in once in a while. That is not a surprise. Now, if you never do that, you're going to have a surprise. Now, a surprise is, and I don't remember who it was, and if it was you, you'll have to come up to me after church and tell me, but somebody came to me that had just bought a new car. They had the car about a month, a new truck, and a big old new truck. And I remember going out to see their truck in the parking lot, and they were bragging on their truck. They were showing me all the bells and whistles in the truck. And the next week they came to church, I said, how's your truck? And they went, uh, uh. I said, what happened? They go, you won't believe it. Okay, let's hear this. I'm driving down I-95, 70 miles an hour, and the truck locks up in the middle of the highway. Ooh, and the transmission locked up. And apparently it's a known defect in this truck. And I went, blah, blah, blah. Now that's unexpected. That's not something you would write down. 
I brought a new car. I hope it breaks down. <laughs> Every once in a while, I hear a, a recall on a new car, and I think, which is mean, but I think, good thing I didn't buy that one. You ever do that? Anybody do? Come on, let's be honest. Evil. You people are evil. Oh, okay, I'm just kidding. All right. So, <laughs> Nehemiah 2. I'm apparently in a mood this morning. I don't know. It's the, it's the, it's the uh, coat hanger in my shirt. It's driving me crazy. I'm just going to make it worse here. Uh, maybe I should have just left it in. Did I make it worse? Yeah, I did. Okay. Nehemiah 2, 9 and 10. So I went to the governors of trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. Time out. You probably don't even notice this sentence. You would read right past it if you weren't paying attention. Hey, even if Nehemiah didn't know it, the king knew there were going to be people not happy about this. Nehemiah might have had no... It doesn't say I asked for. It says the king sent people with me. Why? Because the king liked Nehemiah and thought, we don't want him dead before he gets there. Because somebody's not going to like this. And by the way, we know who doesn't like it because here it comes. When Sanballat, which sounds like Star Wars. That's just a perfect, like Obi-Wan was with Sam Ballot in the desert, and they had to fight with lightsabers. When Sam Ballot the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, by the way, Tobiah the Ammonite, uh, the Ammonites, that, that might have been one of the groups that was excluded earlier from being counted as Jewish. So they may have been offended. The, the first group was Samaritans, but this group was one that said, we're Jewish. And they said, prove it. And they said, we can't. And they said, now you're not Jewish anymore. So they would be ticked off about that. So that's what this is about. The official heard about this and they were very much disturbed. And the word disturbed here is the idea they were ticked off. It's that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I got to say this for a second. In case you don't know it, it's not something new that there's people that hate Israel. I, I know that's a shocker to some people like, everybody loves Israel. What are you talking about? Nay, nay. And it's always been true. It's not a new thing. If you're struggling with whether you think uh, uh, Israel has been a country for a long time. A couple of references in scripture. Just coincidence. And these people are not happy. I don't want them to prosper. I want them to fail. That is nothing new. Just make sure you don't participate in it. Amen. Okay? So, so here we go. One of the things I want you to know is when you begin to succeed, people who haven't succeeded or even people who have failed will attack you sometimes. And I'll be honest with you. Sometimes they're in your family. I mean, you can love them, but you got to realize the reason that they're pulling on you is they can't take it that you are doing what God wants you to do and you keep going forward when they don't. And you make them feel like a worse failure because you're beginning to have success. So they pull on you because of that. And that's what's happening here. I will tell you that starting a second service has led to a lot of frustration for a lot of people, not just me. Because it's a change. It's something different. So what do you do when you have a change and you're dealing with resistance and not everything's going well? You don't focus on the problems. You focus on what you want God to do. Because I don't know about you, but I've had story after story after story about people who've come to this church for the first time. And haven't been to church in years. Or maybe never had a relationship with Christ. And all of a sudden they were sitting here. And something that was said or somebody that encouraged them helped them to realize, wait a second, I've been going the wrong way. And they surrender their life to Christ. And all of a sudden they're radically different. Somebody who was mean is all of a sudden kind. Somebody who did not have good relationships with their family begins to restore relationships with their family. People radically change. And whenever I get like, why do we do this? It's so much more work. I could have gotten up later this morning. Could have slept in on a cold day. 
could have eaten more bacon, could have gone to breakfast with these guys. But when that happens, I think, I remember when Bob came to church and he was such an angry man. And God got a hold of him and changed him. And I remember him renewing his relationship with his daughter that he had not spoken to in 20 years. And I think another Bob might show up for church. Another Bob might show up because we now have room for people to come. And so what do we need to do now? Well, now we have to fill it up again. Now we have to let people know that we're here. Now we have to invite friends and neighbors and other people because we need more to do. No! Because we want to see heaven full and hell empty. And so we say, God, would you use us? And so even though there's challenges, needing more people to serve, needing more people to greet, needing more people to help with sound and video and all the other stuff that comes in that list, all those things that happen, they're this big in the light of eternity. And that's what Nehemiah realized. In the light of the consequence, what was happening and these guys resisting him was not a big deal. Is there somebody resisting you in your life? Are you focusing on them or are you focusing on what the big deal is? i got to finish this sermon. Here we go, Acts 15. If you think it's something new, when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, elders, whom they reported everything God had done. So everybody was excited. And then it says this, Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law. They just told everybody, This is all the awesome stuff that happened. And the next thing that happens is, Well, we don't like it. Don't be surprised if the people that resist you sometimes are Christians. Or family. Or people that you love and care about. It's okay. It's okay. Just know that's normal. Dave Ramsey says, adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. Number three, let trusted others help to evaluate. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night, listen, with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well, the dung, the dung gate. Isn't that a great name for a gate? You can guess what happens there. Examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved towards the fountain gate, the king's pool, but there wasn't enough room for my mount to get through. Basically, my horse, my donkey, whatever I was riding, couldn't get through. So I went by the valley at night examining the wall. Finally, I turned back, re-entered through the valley gate. Listen, the officials did not know where I'd gone, what I was doing, because yet I had said nothing to the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or any other who would be doing the work. So here's the point. Do not, listen, listen, enablers and codependents, do not trust everyone. There are people in your life that if you share information as you are moving forward with, they will use that information to attack you. So be careful who your friends are. But I would also say this, those of you who are islands in the stream, who are isolated and islands unto yourself, you need a few close friends. You need a friend who will look at you and go, I'm not so sure about that. You need a friend who will say to you, you need to keep going. One of the reasons I love the men's breakfast on Wednesday morning is it's a time that some of the men say, could you pray for my marriage? Could you pray for this situation? Could you pray for what's going on at work? And you need some people like that in your life. And if you don't have them, I encourage you this year, get those people in your life. Look for a Bible study. Look to join a team. Look to be a part of the men's breakfast or the women's lunch. And go out of your way to say, I am going to find a few people I can trust. But listen, enablers, please don't trust everyone. Nehemiah knew that. He knew who to trust. I love Rodney and Steve. They both come to our staff meetings every week, and there are two men who will say to me, Pastor, I'm not so sure about this. Maybe this is something we can change. Maybe this is something we can work on. Mike's one of these, when it comes to the finances, will go, oh, I don't know about that. And he knows after all these years, I'm going to look at him and go, well, we're doing it anyway. <laughs> and Diane will say, well, this is what's going on. We've got to work on this. Listen, you need a few people around you that sometimes will tell you when you're wrong. If you don't have those people, get them. I want this year to be a year of change for you and a year of growth. 
Look at these principles and begin to say, God, there may be resistance, there may be struggle, but would you give me some people who can help me as I go to grow and to build on what you have done in my life? What's your challenge right now? Ask God to give you a plan. Ask God to help you evaluate what you need to do next. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. You can come up and I'd be glad to share with you about that. Maybe you just need prayer. Maybe you need prayer because you have a cough that won't stop. So you just come up after the service and I'll be glad to pray for you, okay? Thanks for coming this morning. Let's close in prayer. God bless you. <laughs> Lord, thank you for this morning. I pray, Father, I know there's folks who are here who are struggling with different things. Lord, maybe they're struggling with physical ailment, ailments. Maybe they're struggling with mental or emotional situations. Lord, would you give them your grace and your strength? I pray also for a few close friends that could encourage them on this journey. Lord, continue to grow our church, not because we want to grow, but we want to see people come to know you and have the peace that passes understanding from you. Thank you for this time today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close our service. We're going to have